This is evolution unit review for our unit test. It covers standards 5.1, 5.2, and 5.3. The theory of evolution is that um, species will change over time. This is how we have our modern organisms that exist right now. They descended or came from ancient organisms. Most people think of evolution as happening like this. A fish becomes somehow a salamander and then a monkey and then us. This is not how it happens. It's a series of small changes and we're going to look at those. One important person to know is Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin took a voyage on a ship called the HMS Beagle around the world and the most important place that he stopped was the Galapagos Islands. Here he noticed all the differences among individuals of a species. This is what natural variation is. Variation means differences, a variety. We now know that these differences are genetic traits. They can be good or they can be bad. These genetic traits and the differences are caused by either mutations, which is going to change the DNA sequence, or gene shuffling, the random mixing of genes during sexual reproduction, meaning that every sperm and egg is different, so you're going to create um, a variety of organisms. Now the most important thing that Darwin um, wrote in his book was that evolution happened by natural selection. We know that there is a struggle for our existence in the environment. Species have to compete for food, where they live, and for mates. What this means is that certain individuals have a greater fitness than others. You might think of fitness as working out in the gym and you're able to run a mile, but fitness in evolution means the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in its environment. For example, the fastest lion in a pride will get the most food, which means that that lion has a high fitness compared to the slower lions because they are more likely to survive and reproduce. This is because the lion has an adaptation. He inherited a characteristic, running fast, that increases his success, that increases his fitness or chance of survival. So really natural selection is that only the members of a population with the highest fitness, the best traits or adaptations, will reproduce and pass on those traits. Over a long period of time, this is going to result in a higher fitness for the entire species because only those will survive and reproduce and have offspring that have the sim similar traits and are going to survive and reproduce so that in the end, all the lions will be quite fast runners. Again, this takes many generations to see the effects. It can't happen overnight or just from you to your children. It takes millions of years to see the effects of natural selection. As you can see, here is the modern horse all the way on the right, and we have, um, back in the day, what, we, what the horse evolved from, and you can see it changing over time. This is the idea that um, of descent with modification, that species that are alive today have descended or came from ancestor species. But again, with changes, there must have been a, a greater um, fitness for animals that were larger. Maybe they were able to run faster. This also brings us to the idea of common descent. That idea that all species have, over long periods of time, descended from common ancestors. That means that really all of us are related because we are all derived from ancestor species. When we're talking about a population and talking about fitness, it's important to define the term gene pool. It's not a literal pool of water like shown here, but what you can see is going in are all the alleles, all the genes. Or for example, here in a frog, you can see that the alleles that are most common in the frog population are green. There must be an advantage to being a green frog over being purple or red. So a gene pool is just basically all of the genes found in a certain population of organisms. Okay, so a population is in a certain area. So maybe this is the population of frogs, frogs right outside of Kieftak. We need to know the evidences of evolution. You're, you need to know at least two for your unit test and be able to explain them. 
the most popular is the fossil record, probably the easiest one and the one that Darwin used. But we can also look at geographic distribution, similarities in body structures, similarities in development, and finally molecular biology. So pick two that you are most comfortable with. I think the easiest ones are the fossil record and molecular biology, and we'll see why. Looking at the fossil record, we can see that fossils are preserved remains or markings of once living organisms. So here in this example, we see the many layers of rock over time with fossils in between. The layers on the bottom are the oldest and the top is the youngest. So we can look at this and show several things. We can see that living things have existed on Earth for millions of years. We can see that some things no longer exist and we can look at each generation of fossils and see how species have changed over time and produce new species over and over. Geographic distribution is the idea that in different parts of the world there are similar organisms like the beaver in North America and the capybara in South America, but they have adapted to their environment so there are slight differences between them. This proves that there is some sort of common ancestor or ancestral species that these organisms evolved from. Another popular one to mention is similarities in structure. You can see the structure of the forelimbs of a human, a cat, a whale, and a bat. And if you look closely, you can see similar structures. For example, the humerus in our arm is very similar to the cat and the whale and the bat. Then you can see the radius and ulna in each of these in the lower part of the arm. You can also see the wrist bones, which are colored in yellow, and the finger bones. So all of these organisms have what we call homologous structures. Remember that homo means same. So these are similar structures in different animals, and this shows that they share a common ancestor. So yes, we are related to cats, whales, and bats. But Obviously, we're going to be more related to certain things than others. You can look at the human and the cat, and they look the most similar compared to a human and a whale. So we have a closer ancestor with a cat than we do to a whale. Another important thing about structures is that we have vestigial organs, and other organisms have these as well. They're basically leftovers or remnants of structures that once had important functions in our ancestors. For example, a tailbone. We don't have a tail anymore, but our ancestors did. So it's just left over, even though we don't have a tail anymore. Or our appendix, it does nothing for us, and usually we have to get it removed because it gets infected. But in our ancestral species, it was really important for digesting the food that they ate. We can also look at similarities in development. Looking at these embryos of a fish, salamander, turtle, chicken, rabbit, and human, we can see that these look all fairly similar. And as they go forward, they change over time, so that when they're adults, they look quite different. But we can see that they're still going through similar stages of development. This shows that they have similar DNA and have a common ancestor. You can tell which ones are more closely related than others. A fish and a salamander have more in common than a rabbit and a human. A rabbit and a human are quite more similar than, say, a human and a fish. So they must be more closely related. The last type of evidence is molecular biology. This is the idea that the more similar the DNA, the more closely related they are. So for example, chimpanzees and humans share 98% of the same exact DNA sequences. This means we are closely related to chimpanzees, whereas bananas, we only have 50% of the same DNA. So we're still related to bananas because we're related to everything, but not as closely related as to chimpanzees. So we've been talking about species and we need to say what they are. A species are a group of organisms that have two things, have similar traits and can reproduce and make fertile offspring. This last part is key and most people forget about. You have to be able to have children and have those children be able to make more children. So, for example, a mule is made of two different species. It's made of a female horse and a male donkey. Therefore, a mule is not considered a species 
because it cannot have children itself. So horses are a separate species than donkeys because if they were the same species, they could reproduce and make a mule that could then have more mules, but that's not the case. We've been talking about how new species form over time through natural selection, but we need to also mention how this happens in different ways. The fact that species can be separated from each other, either through their behaviors, their location, or differences in timing. We'll look at these three. Behavioral isolation is when two populations have different either courtship rituals or mate, other mating behaviors. So two birds may have different songs or dances that they perform to attract mates, or they may build their nests differently, or they have different coloring on them, and these are going to influence whether or not they are going to reproduce. And over time, they can become different species. Geographic isolation is when two populations are geographically or physically separated, for example, by mountains, rivers, islands, or large bodies of water. If they're separated, they physically can't mate and they'll change over time. And the last one is temporal isolation. Think T for temporal, T for time. This is when two species reproduce at different times of the years. For example, frogs, some species reproduce in the spring and others reproduce later in the summer, so they cannot mate with each other. Or for example, also different flowers will open at different times of the day to receive pollen. We can see speciation or the formation of species in Darwin's evidences of finches. We have 13 species of finches that you can see on the picture, and he saw these on the Galapagos Islands. They're all very similar in size and coloring, but he noticed that they all have different beak shapes because they all have different available food on the different islands. But he saw that even though they're all very similar and have different beaks, they have evolved from a common ancestor from a mainland in South America because they are genetically similar to those mainland finches. So we've been talking about all the differences in life. All these differences in evolution can happen in three different ways. Natural selection, the idea that the most fit for the environment will survive and reproduce, genetic variation, the differences that we get from mutations and gene shuffling, and speciation. That's caused by either behavioral, temporal, or geographic isolation. All of these are going to create a variety of different species on Earth. We classify organisms and name organisms both extinct and living to show the relationships between all species. We can use the following to classify species. We can use their evolutionary relationships, how closely related they are, their DNA, their cell type, whether they're prokaryotes or eukaryotes, their mode of nutrition, whether they're autotrophs or heterotrophs, whether they use photosynthesis or chemosynthesis, cell number, whether they're unicellular or multicellular, and their cell structures, for example, if they have chloroplast or a cell wall. Linnaeus was a scientist who organized organisms into different groups from very broad or general to very specific. The first thing that he used was kingdom. There are six kingdoms now called eubacteria, archaea bacteria, protists, fungi, plants, and animals. But Linnaeus, um, we have modified Linnaeus's um, categori um, categories because we've added one more um, before kingdom, we've added domain above that, which is even broader. There's only three domains. And we've learned about this before when we talked about um, our cells. Next um, category is phylum, then class, then order, then family, then genus, and then species. So for example, here we have an example of humans and how they are categorized into those different classifications, those different groups. So it goes from the most general to the most specific. There's many different types of species. When we name an organism, we need to make sure we're doing it correctly. We give the last two groups. We give the genus and the species of the organisms. So for example, for humans, our genus that we belong to is Homo, and our species, we're considered sapiens. So we would say that humans are Homo sapiens. Or for example, lions. Lions are Felicis leo. 
we always give that because if I say there's a cat outside, I might think of a little house cat. Whereas if I say that in Africa, that might be a wild cat like a tiger. Scientists use a chart to show the evolutionary relationships between different species. This is how the chart works. The oldest organism goes at the bottom and the um, youngest one goes on top. So you can see that a hagfish and a perch have existed long before a chimpanzee and a mouse. And basically what it shows is what's changing over time and creating new organisms. So for example, jaws are not found in hagfish, but they are now found in each of these animals. Perch do not have lungs, but after the perch, all these organisms have lungs, like a salamander, lizard, pigeon, and mouse. Again, with claws or nails, if something is um, on a line like this, this means that feathers are individual to pigeons. Nothing else here has feathers. The closer the, or the shorter the branches, the more closely related the two species are. So for example, chimpanzees and mouses are more or mice are more closely related than say chimpanzees and pigeons or chimpanzees and lizards or chimpanzees and salamanders. The same can go for salamanders and lizards. These are closer together, so they're more closely related than, say, a salamander and a mouse. 